It's a pleasure to have you join us on another episode of the program. I am Okmayemi Oboshini. We start off with business news. Now, just a few weeks after the federal government approved a special purpose vehicle to support the delivery of an additional 90,000 kilometers of fiber optic cables, that's we're going to talk to the World Bank, the Minister of Communications and Digital Economy, Boston Tijani, disclosed this while announcing the kickoff of Nigeria Week in Washington, United States. The project aims to increase Nigeria's fiber optic cable capacity from 35,000 kilometers to 125,000 kilometers, making it Africa's third longest terrestrial fiber optic backbone behind South Africa and Egypt. Tijani, who co-founded CC Orb, that's Nigeria's first tech orb in 2010, continues to advocate that broadband must be treated as a matter of urgency for Nigeria to advance the digital economy. State governors have called for the refund of state government's full equity investment in the $10 billion National Integrated Power Project that are under the management of the Niger Delta Power Holding Company. In addition to this, the governors under their umbrella body, Nigeria Governors Forum, said the federal government should refund an equitable return of return on their investment in the power plant. They made the demands in the documents tied to development of the National Integrated Electricity Policy and Strategic Implementation Plan Policy recommendations by state government, which was submitted to the Federal Ministry of Power. NIPPSS refers to a government-led initiative launched in 2004 to improve Nigeria's electricity generation capacity. Welcome back. The Nigerian Deposit Insurance Corporation, NDIC, has listed the head office in Lagos and branches of failed heritage bank across the country for selling its role as liquidator of the country. NDIC announced the sale of the bank properties numbering 48 and its charter including vehicles, office equipment, plant and machinery in another 62 locations across the country on Thursday. Bids are expected to come in with 10% of the bid mounted in certified bank draft and successful bidders will also be required to pay the balance of the bid price within two weeks of notification. Earlier, the corporation announced the commencement of the verification and payment of the depositors of the banks with 5 million naira or less in their account. Now, this category of customers makes up about 99% of the bank customers. Shareholders of FCMB Group PLC have expressed confidence that the 150 billion naira capital raising program of the group would be achieved. This was at the 11th annual general meeting of the group, where the shareholders also aired the management for the performance of the bank in 2023. The Secretary General of the Independent Shareholders Association of Nigeria, A.K. Emmanuel, applauded FCMB's group's result and endorsed a capital raising program. At the meeting, the shareholders approved an increase in issued share capital from 9.90 billion naira to 19.80 billion naira. They also authorized a 150 billion naira capital rise to drive future growth plans, as well as a 100% increase in dividend payout to 50 kobo per share from 25 kobo in 2023. We'll go on a short break, but when Money Matter returns, we'll be discussing the National Pension Commission approving the disbursement of 14.2 billion naira to 8,651 Nigerians who experienced temporary job loss in the first quarter of 2024. I'll bring you details of this and more after this short break. <laughs>
Welcome back. Now, the National Pension Commission, PENCOM, has approved the disbursement of 14.2 billion naira to 8,651 Nigerians who experienced temporary job loss in the first quarter of 2024. The total sum disbursed reflects the considerable financial support provided to these individuals under the age of 50 years, now averaging around 1.64 million naira per person. This move is part of the measures to alleviate the financial challenges faced by individuals due to unemployment, providing much-needed relief amid ongoing economic difficulties in Nigeria. Now, according to the first quarter of 2024 report of PENCOM, a total of 8,702 retirement savings account holders requested to access 25% of their RSA balances due to temporary loss of employment. Now, of these 8,651 requests were approved, while about 51 were rejected because the applicants were above 50 years of age. Now, well, joining me to discuss this further is the head HNI and corporate at Kawiwai's Financial Technology Limited, Mr. Oye Yinka Oyekon. Um, thank you for joining me on the program, Mr. Oyekon. Now, um, what is your assessment of um, the recent disbursement of 14.2 billion naira to over 8,000 Nigerians who experienced um, temporary job loss in the first quarter of 2024? Well, well this cannot, you know, be. Uh, this can only be related to the current economic onpers in the country. Uh, however, it would be very good to note that um, we can dimension this group of people into three. Uh, there are some that must have lost their jobs, say, between four months to six months ago. Uh, there are some that lost their job perhaps maybe up to a year ago. You know, so maybe it won't be related to these current problems in the economy. Then there will be a third group that perhaps they resigned a long time ago and they are doing their business. Uh, it's just that the current situation has necessitated them, you know, having a, getting access to to their funds with um, to their RSA funds. Back to you. Thank you. So, like, um, how, how do you interpret the increase in reliance on pension funds um, as a financial safety net in Nigeria? That's um, as evidenced by the growing um, total amount of bosses, um, its inception. Yeah, yeah, just to note, uh, I think over 289 billion naira has been disbursed since inception. That's 2004. Uh, however, I think that, you know, one should not rely on just the pension funds alone. You know, as a, as a worker, as an employee, uh, we should have at least six months um, of funds uh, saved up perhaps in a mutual, in a mutual fund that, that can serve as a safety net. Uh, we can also look at other sources of income, say a passive or active source of income. Uh, but of course, you have to you know, you know, agree with your employer before you do that. Then we, we also need to manage our expenses very well. So reliance on the, our pension funds should, should actually be a last resort, not a first point of call when things really go south. Back to you. Now, um, the private sector seems to be more affected by job loss, with 94.4% um, of the total approvals in the first quarter of 2024 coming from the private sector. Now, what factors do you think contributed to this trend, and then what are its um, implications for the economy? From, from my own perspective, um, I think that you know, the private sector see the numbers more clearly uh, than the public sector. I mean... Uh, on a daily basis, you are trying to match costs vis-a-vis -vis revenues. So when the cost of doing business is so high and is exceed exceeding the revenues coming into your company, you start to look at cost-cutting measures. So, you know, to, truth be told, and uh, to be honest, a lot of companies look at other cost-cutting measures before they now look at, oh, perhaps we could downsize or right-size or not employ for the moment, you know. So those are, and that's the first thing off, off my mind. You know, uh, the, the cost of doing business has really increased uh, when, you talk, when you think about the policies the government instituted last year. You know, however, you know, I, I must be very responsible to say that if the government had not put in, you know, those economic policies, uh, the, the situation today could have been cataclysmic. You know, I'm, I must say that. Uh, you know, but however, the, the real effect on the economy may just, you know, be a bump in the GDP because of the job losses, um, you know, and that, I, I think that's, that will be the real, real, 
you know, effect on it. Just a, maybe like a bump in the GDP. But of course, uh, purchasing power would, you know, be greatly impacted in the future and, you know, things like that. Thank you very much. Now, um, given that um, the job loss affects all sectors to some extent, uh, why, why do you think the private sector sees significantly more approvals for um, that um, punch, um, pension for the disbursement when compared to the public sector? In, for that, in my view, I think, uh, you know, like they say in the past, if you work in the public sector, there's a lot of you know, job security. Uh, because of one, um, mm -hmm. most, most governments who want to lay off staff on a mass scale uh, for social political reasons, you know. Also, um, you know, if you just lay off a lot of staff and a lot of employees at the public level, you know, it, it, you know, to trade, to trade bad light on the on the government of the day. However, if the NLC at this point keeps pushing for something very, very high, I mean, the minimum wage now, uh, it may be an inevitable situation. You know, but in the in the in the private sector, as mentioned, up in issue, you are seeing the numbers. You know, you know, some companies even look at it almost on a monthly. Some are even so detailed uh, that they look at it on a daily basis. The reporting team are looking at the revenue, and so they are looking at the cost vis-a-vis uh, -vis projected revenue. So they can take decisions immediately. And I must say, a lot of private organizations don't just go ahead and sack immediately. No, there are so many things that would have been done. They would have tried to manage costs from different perspectives, look at different ways they can you know, increase revenue as well, uh, look at other business channels. Uh, then maybe uh, you know, at, at some point, they will not be looking at the wage bill so that you know, they can't downsize. That's it. Okay, so the disbursement of pension funds um, is, um, provides temporary relief to individuals facing financial difficulties due to unemployment. Now, in your opinion, what are the long-term economic implications of this practice? Because pension is meant to be gotten after re um, retirement. So now that people are getting it because of, um, due to lack of unemployment, what do you think the repercussion will be? Um, to be honest, I personally do not see a long term economic implications here. So one is that um, RSA holders have their rights. You know, is their right, they are exercising their right to access 25% um, if they leave, you know, their jobs. And, you know, as of today, the act um, is very, very clear. Um, they can't go below that 25%. Uh, so um, what I just see is that PFAs, you know, may lose part of their assets under management. I mean, as of now, I think uh, the total assets are about 19 trillion naira. So if you take 25% of that, you can have 14.75 trillion naira. However, I don't see a situation where all the employees in Nigeria would be, you know, downside. So I, I don't think it may have, you know, such economic implications as such, except for the PFAs whose prof profitability may be impacted if uh, there's a mass mass um, mass layoff across the across the country and when i say mass maybe 50 percent of the employee of the workforce in nigeria which most likely is impossible thank you very much the disbursement of pension funds provides temporary relief to um, individuals facing financial difficulties due to unemployment so now in your opinion what are the long-term economic implications of um, this practice Yes, uh, truth be told, the inflationary pressures are there, and you know, sadly so again. Um, at this point in our national history, uh, a lot of people have to be going through, um, you know, inflationary pressures and all that. And and you know, luckily our Pencom Act is structured, our Pension Act rather, is structured in such a way that you can have a safety net of about twenty five percent, you know, um, which is very good. Um, but what I would say, in essence, at this point, is that um, recollect I said that some people are now just accessing their twenty-five percent. Uh, perhaps they had resigned a long time ago, uh, say one to two years or you know more. But because of the you know credit crunch in the, in the system um, or the economic impasse, as it were, they are now just you know accessing their funds. Uh, so I think it's a very good safety net, at least. Uh, but personally, I think it should be the last point of call because, you know, uh, pension funds should be for retirement.
Thank you very much. Inflation in Nigeria increased to 33.69% in um, April 2024. Now, how does this high inflation rate and volatile um, economic conditions contribute to the financial instability faced by many citizens? Um, and how does the disbursement of pension funds fit into addressing um, these challenges? Yeah, I think it, you know, it actually addresses it. Um, the act as it were today, I believe strongly um, that it should be left intact as it were today, you know, 25% um, should be the figure. Uh, but as I just said, you know, uh, when people retire sometimes, the, the retirement savings account balance is usually the only savings they have, you know. So if they are, you know, taking more than 25% out of it, then that means they will have nothing. You know, instead, I, I think at even at national level, we should promote financial fitness or financial fitness sensitization. You know, uh, we should look at areas of, um, you know, having more savings aside your salary. You know, even in the pension scheme, you can have what is called the additional voluntary contribution. So aside your normal pension deduction that is mandatory by government, there's also additional voluntary contribution that the employees can, you know, undertake uh, by their own volition. Um, you should have things like your life insurance in place. There's even, you know, job loss insurance that will pay you some salary for six months. I, I know that a lot of insurance companies offer that. Uh, we should also have, at the minimum, a simple will. Um, we should have multiple sources of income. But, of course, you know, employees have to discuss with their organizations or their employers to see if, you know, they can explore what we call side hustles these days. And, of course, we need to manage our expenses. Things are not the same as they were before. As you, as you would, you know, agree with me, in the past, you know, one year or plus, um, the exchange rate has devalued for up to 200 to 300%. So, you know, we need to really manage our expenses. Things are not the same right now. So, uh, again, like I said, I've been issue, you need to have at least six months in savings in some mutual fund or some investment. I know it's not easy. It won't be easy to even achieve it. But if one tries it, one can achieve it. Thank you. Back to you. Well, um, how do you think government and policy makers can work to create some more robust economic policies and job creation strategies to address the underlying issues contributing to job loss and financial instability in the country? Okay, uh, thank you. It, personally, also in all these, I see opportunities, you know, in all, <laughs> in all that is happening in the country. I see opportunities. It may be difficult for us. Uh, some countries, uh, I don't want to mention in any country in the Southeast Asia, uh, had to, you know, ring fence their borders and all those kind of things um, to drive economic growth, which we are seeing today. Um, but now, uh, at the level of Nigeria, I think the government at the national and at the subnational level or states. Uh, should create an enabling environment, you know, to foster growth, things like power. I'm very happy today that, you know, power is, you know, on the concurrent list, you know, and, you know, so a lot of, you know, state governments can also provide power to cluster manufacturing companies. And manufacturing companies can be macro, medium, and micro. What it means is that in a flat, you could, you could be a manufacturer. And everybody should, you know, get into manufacturing and try to export. So aside power, we also need to look at transportation infrastructure. So transportation of goods that has been manufactured from the point of manufacture to the ports. I know that a lot of uh, state governments are also, you know, you know uh, building cargo airports. I know there's one in Ogun State, aside the one in Lagos. I mean, you need to go to the one in Lagos um, and see a lot of people there trying to export goods and services. And, to export their goods out of the country. If that can be re replicated in many states in Nigeria, a lot of people will be gainfully employed. And imagine the exchange rate of today. One dollar is at the minimum, let's take an average of 1,500 Naira. So if you're exporting something that is worth $1,000, do the math. You're making a lot of money. So I think the numbers should be thrown out there you know, for people to see the opportunities so that they can embrace you know, e e exportation. Also, we need to reduce the barriers, you know, that limitates and frustrates people from doing businesses in Nigeria. So governments, especially at the subnational level, should look at, you know, businesses in their domains, you know, uh, to see how they can remove bureaucracies that is frustrating them, you know, to, 
you know, to do business. Also, government needs to support indigenous, indigenous producers. You know, um, if someone is manufacturing something in Nigeria, I think the government needs to, you know, patronize them and also encourage the people of the country to patronize them. And if the government is not patronizing us as of this point, we the people should patronize, you know, locally made, locally made, you know, goods. But, you know, let me hold it there. Some, you know, some other pointers that I want to talk about, you know, uh, is that government needs to work with the standard organizations of Nigeria and another standardization um, agencies in Nigeria to ensure that our products are competitive in the foreign market space. Also, we need to see how we can provide cheaper funding to make, to make producers in Nigeria more competitive than the foreign ones. Because, you know, if you take... Um, some situations where, you know, foreign foreign companies are bringing products into the country or even coming to set up shop in the country and they've gotten um, loans at single digit inter interest rates compared to the ones, their counterparts in Nigeria, that interest rates on loans are the region of 30%. You can see already that they are not competitive. So I think, you know, we need to look inwards to look at ways where we can provide funding for these businesses at a very cheap rate. Also, to encourage local production, we also need to look at our tariff regime. You know, if someone is producing something in country, perhaps the tariff to import the same product should be higher so that, you know, we can encourage the local producer to be more competitive within the country and perhaps export more. So in, by saying that, we also need to look at our, you know, our borders and, you know, you know, create a tighter border so we can, of course, manage smuggling and all those kind, those kind of things. Now, now the, the 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 last thing I will say on this question is that you know we need to really look inward as a nation. It's very important. We need to support our local producers. Uh, by the time we support local producers at the micro, macro, and medium levels, there will be a lot of jobs that will be created across board. Imagine some of the big companies that are living, they are living a lacuna. So those companies may not be scaled properly when it comes to costs. But, you know, someone that is just starting business in this environment would have, you know, perhaps managed or, or be able to start the business at a much lower cost than those, you know, huge organizations. The other day, I saw a company that's already filling the gap of one big organization that just left. They are producing you know, diapers already, you know, and there are so many people fitting into the shoes of some of the companies that have left. So, you know, it may be very bad. There'll be job losses. I agree 100%, but it's an opportunity for you and I and the government to take advantage of. Thank you very much. Now, ju just just before I let you go, Mr. Oyeko, looking ahead, what do you think are the key um, priorities for ensuring long-time financial security and um, the stability of Nigerian citizens? That's particularly in the face of ongoing economic challenges and uncertainties. Thank you for that question. And, you know, the problem is here. You know, the problem is with us. You know, we're in it. Uh, so the first thing um, is to promote financial literacy. Um, like I said, the, the, the problem is with us. There's a, there's a cash crunch, there's an economic impasse, and all those kind of things. Um, like I said, I've been issue uh, as individuals, we need to look at other sources, multiple sources of income. But of course, you have to talk with your employer before you look at that. So that, you know, if you are laid off on one, there'll be a safety net of another. Um, also, uh, we need to have a budget as an, as an individual. Uh, we need to, of course, save for your wants and, and you, know, you know, budget for your needs. Save for your wants, budget for your needs. You know, put some funds aside, aside every month uh, to save and invest so that you have, you know, a big pot of safety nets that you can fall back on if anything happens to you. Of course, remember I said save and invest. Savings is different from investing. You know, saving is, you know, keeping some funds aside that is a bit more liquid, but it's the action of putting money aside that is saving. But you also need to invest part of the funds. You know, you can take, you know, advantage of the mutual funds that are out there in the market. You, know, you can take advantage of other, you know, instruments that are out there in the market. You know, uh, like I said, also I've been issue, it's good to have at least six months of your salary saved you know, back end so that you have a safety net. Or if you can't do that, you can take an insurance policy that guarantees you at least some payments for six months. The product is out there that we can take advantage of. 
And lastly, we need to, you know, take insurance policies to protect our assets and all those kind of things. Have at least a simple will um, and all those kind of things. So uh, to round it up, I would say that, you know, financial fitness literacy is very important and key so that, you know, we can, we can withstand the shocks of the society when things happen, you know, as such uh, as had happened last year to this year. Thank you very much. Well, Ed, HNI and Corporate at Kauriwai Financial Technology Limited, Mr. Oye Yinka Oye Kong. Many thanks for lending your thoughts on the program. Well, that's it on this episode of the program. Many thanks for joining us. I am Okba Yemi Uwoshi. See you next time.